Hello, I'm excited to be part of UEN's Reimagine Learning event today so we can discuss making sure that learning is designed on purpose. I wish I could say I was happy to be with you today, but of course I'm not with you today. And uh, in any case, I look forward to the opportunity to discuss important issues and learn together. Well, let me first introduce who I am. My name is Corey Henwood. I'm the Innovation Coordinator at Iron County Schools, and uh, that basically means that I take on uh, strategic innovation in the school district, including digital teaching and learning, uh, including competency-based education, and including computer science and some other things as well. One of the things I'm most excited and proud about is our work to begin to develop a personalized competency-based high school in Iron County, and the name of that is launch high school and that'll be opening just in a couple weeks here i'm excited about that it allows for students to uh, have a personalized uh, experience in education allowing them to take on projects with local business partners and that is how they demonstrate their mastery of concepts and move on in a competency based format so that's a really exciting thing i could talk for hours about that i'll spare you right now and would love to chat with you and connect with you uh, on Twitter or otherwise uh, through email, and you've got that there for you. So um, my first question to kick us off today is, what is the purpose of school? I mean, really, what is the purpose of school? What would you identify that? Can you define that? Um, think about the societal purpose of school. There are certainly uh, reasons civically and economically for schools. Um, one of them I push back on is that uh, we need to be babysitters for uh, our economy. I, that's not the core purpose of school. But think deeply about the purpose of school. Can you define it? And if you can't, think just for a minute. How might we define the purpose of school? I hear answers to that question some, somewhere in this realm of, you know, we need to create lifelong learners. We need to... Uh, Prepare for contributing members of society. Prepare uh, conscientious citizens. Prepare students for success in life and career. Those kind of things, uh, I think, are really at the purpose of school. And this is becoming more and more important that we define this, in particular in this time that we're living now with COVID and the possibility of remote learning and what we've seen already. It makes uh, this more relevant because we know that we focused on far too many things and uh, thinking that everything that we've taught in K-12 schools has been essential. And COVID, if it has provided one silver lining, it's to put pressure on us to be more leaner, more targeted with our approach and our purpose to what we deliver with students, knowing that not everything is viable. Uh, we need to really have a clear defined purpose for that work. And that purpose really has always been to prepare students to contribute uh, to society, to have success in life and career. Our system was established in the industrial age to prepare students for a largely routine workforce, which it did to perfection. But now we've lived more than 30 years uh, in the information age where information is more accessible than it's ever been. And yet we continue to teach and assess as if information were scarce. It's clear that our assessments rarely value resourcefulness and the ability to access the information you need. I mean, have you been to a test center recently? I mean, those places are more locked down than an airport. And you see, if all the information in the world were locked up in dead trees and wise minds, then an education system that was an information delivery system that assessed whether you could retain that information, well, that might be completely justified, but we are way beyond that. And as we enter into an innovation age where any routine skill that can be automated by machines is automated by machines, from blue collar work on the assembly line to white collar bookkeeping. The opportunities for students now and in the future will require at the forefront skills that cannot be automated by machines. Instead, things that not just compete with machines, but actually complement the work of machines. Those essential human skills and dispositions. We see this trend accelerating in the age of automation and Despite that, our students are taught to and assessed heavily on routine skills that machines already manage, goodies that you can already Google, calculations that computers already do for us, or abilities that an app renders obsolete. 
So it brings to mind this question from a friend of mine, Tom Herrick, who asked, are we designing or maybe redesigning now our schools for students' futures? Or are we still designing them based on the nostalgia of parents' past? That's a tough question to reflect on. Now, I know where we've been. Uh, we moved to remote learning, and it was sink or swim for teachers. Teachers quickly became familiar with the technology they needed to help them deliver content and assess knowledge. That was urgently important, and, and uh, you'll probably learn a lot more about those tools today. But now that we've had some time to catch our breath, uh, instead of focusing my remarks on these tools primarily, I'm going to focus more on our purpose and point you towards ensuring that your focus is on that purpose, the one that you just defined for schools. Using these tools to make you more efficient, more effective at delivering and assessing content so you can outsource some of that work and free yourself up to focus on the things that you know are the purpose of school. And there is no better time than now for that kind of transformation. When we look at this challenge, how will we fulfill the purpose of school? And I take on these complex opportunities. I, I love to take those on with using human-centered design thinking process uh, made famous by IDEO. You may know it as design thinking or others. And when we kick on these complex pieces, it's best to do it in phases centered around humans and their needs. And so the three phases I'm going to guide you through today as we think about that purpose are these. First, inspiration, knowing really a little bit more about our challenge and what what the important pieces are from expert opinions, getting smart on it, but then really understanding the people and what they want, what your stakeholders want. And then moving to ideation where you take, generate tons of ideas and identify opportunities that you can bring those to life and begin to prototype those. And then ultimately implementing those solutions, uh, bring them to life with your students and, and ultimately uh, going through several iterations to come up with the best form of how you can implement these solutions to bring about your purpose. So I'm going to guide you through that. The first stage of that is really to seek inspiration. And I'm going to hear from some experts right now about how we can get a little bit more smart on the challenge that we have in front of us about the purpose of schools. For all of human history, the primary focus of education has been acquiring more content knowledge. And the only way to get it is through the teacher, right? You don't have to do that anymore. Today, content is ubiquitous. It's free. It's on every internet-connected device. And it's growing exponentially and changing constantly. The world simply no longer cares how much our kids know. What the world cares about is what they can do with what they know, which is a completely different education problem. A recent study by the RAND Corporation found out that among the state tests that are used for accountability, only about 2% of the items on the math tests measure higher order thinking skills. 98% of the items are, you know, can you apply an algorithm and do the procedure? The problem with that is that quite often people who can identify a particular problem format and crank out an answer or find and guess an answer from a list of five, which schools spend a lot of time on, cannot reason their way through a mathematical application in the real world. We have to prepare students to be resilient, to be thinkers, to be collaborators, to be communicators. We have to prepare them in such a different way. I think there's a sharp trade-off between what can be tested easily on a large scale and what's important in life. Think of a different universe where you're asking kids to invent a science experiment, write a creative essay come up with an interesting historical perspective on an event they care about. Far more important challenges for a kid, far more aligned with what they need to do in the real world when they graduate, much harder to test and very hard to say you got a 731 on this experiment and somebody else got a 627 on the experiment. So that's the existential trade-off we face in education. There's some really big questions here is what should we be teaching? You know, who, is our, who are our major stakeholders? So getting that consensus among all of the players, the parents, the teachers, the business community, the politicians of this is what we want our end product to look like. This is what we want the students coming out prepared to do, not just to know. Until you get that aligned, 
Um, getting tough doesn't matter, because you're getting tough on what? I would argue that beyond the morality of this issue, it's simply a matter of self-interest for all of us. Because if we don't train and teach and really support children from all these backgrounds, they become our responsibility or our fear, the source of our fear. Because we have to teach them about what we consider most important in our society. This is not about something that would be nice to do. This is about the very essence of our future. This is about who we become as a nation. Well, as was mentioned in the video, part of the inspiration phase is seeking input from stakeholders, identifying what are the skills our students need to, and insert your purpose here, whether that is uh, the purpose uh, that we kind of spoke about earlier, to be successful in life and contribute to society, or, or other such purposes, right? What are the skills our students need? We need to ask. And, and why do we need to ask? Well, Honestly, good design starts with the perspective and needs of the people you're designing for, or else you get solutions like this, where Apple has kind of provided this nonsensical solution, if you remember this one, uh, in order to avoid any blemishes or uh, misgivings on the top of the mouse to provide a, a notch for a place for it to charge, it was done underneath, which of course makes no sense. The mouse becomes unusable at that point. So think about that. We need to ask the people that we're designing for, not just kind of be stuck in our own minds of what we feel is most important. And with that, uh, we've done that in Iron County schools. So in Iron County School District, what we were able to do is actually um, seek out input from stakeholders, from business leaders and um, post-secondary educators, community leaders, parents, students, teachers, of course, um, and ask what are the essential skills students need to be successful in their future. And these essential eight skills were at the core of that. I'd suggest you do that with your community, maybe your classroom, maybe your school community, maybe your district. Um, in any case, the state has done something very similar, if you're unfamiliar. Um, they have put out their portrait of a graduate, which identifies ideal characteristics of Utah graduates, and uh, you'll see a lot of overlap as we did. We did ours uh, just before the state uh, did their portrait of graduate work, and of course you see a, a ton of overlap between our portrait of a graduate and theirs, um, because these are the skills that people identify generally as those essential skills. And so seek inspiration from that. Uh, what are they identifying as their needs? And then move from there. Our next piece, we're talk about how we can really come up with several ideas to integrate these essential skills and this purpose into our instruction, our assessments, our reporting, all of what we do in education. And start to brainstorm these ideas. You'll, you'll pick up several uh, uh, across the entire day today as you work through and identify new tools and new practices. Let me identify a couple tools that help to both in a remote learning situation or in a blended learning situation that you could use to help to build some of these essential skills. For example, um, we've got collaboration tools that I've made mention of here, um, things like Poplet or Jamboard that allow you to bring uh, ideas to life and make them visual and collaborate in the form of sticky notes or other Poplets, if you will, uh, of ideas and drawings and images. Uh, or Padlet, which allows folks to collaborate on an idea and actually list out things in these kind of uh, pads that they have there. And of course, uh, Everyone that everyone's become familiar with, either Zoom, Google Meet, or other video conferencing tools that allow for folks to work together remotely. I encourage you to use these as you collaborate with your students and integrate them into uh, your work and potentially explore the ones you're unfamiliar with. Next up, creation tools such as Adobe Spark for creating uh, web graphics and short videos, Tinkercad for creating 3D images and uh, 3D models. Uh, as you prototype and actually print those models potentially in a 3D printer. Minecraft for creating 3D models, and you know kids love Minecraft. Uh, it's a space to create um, and prototype their experiences, their solutions to bring them to life. And also uh, options like Lucidchart for wireframing uh, an idea or an app, or Lucid Press for bringing those ideas to life and presenting them in a professional manner. These are great creation tools. Uh, and then lastly, uh, communication tools, whether that's in uh, the world of social media campaigns. I don't know if we harness that quite enough of our students and their ability to, to campaign for things that they know are important, as well as um, 
tools like uh, Powtoon for creating animated video or Prezi for creating engaging presentations or Anchor for creating podcasts. Uh, take a look at these tools and teach your students to create, whether they're at home or in a blended learning scenario. So you've got some of these ideas. Hopefully this you know, stirred up some ideas for you. Uh, but one of the others that brings all of these kind of skills together in my mind is this idea of design challenges for students. Now, I've listed a couple here that are high school age design challenges for integrating your content, your curriculum with these essential skills, right? Taking on uh, one, for example, here at the bottom to design a solution to combat fake news, hate speech, and inappropriate online sharing for a social media company that respects the First Amendment to the Constitution. So you're taking on censorship, free speech, the Constitution, either government or language arts class or both. And uh, these kind of challenges take students through the, these phases that we're going through right now, teaching them collaboration skills, ways to communicate, create solutions, uh, interesting ideas. And so think about that as you, uh, and I'll have some elementary examples here in just a minute. In addition to that, um, identifying what does it mean to be a good communicator at my grade level and really identifying that. In this case, we've used a proficiency scale. Our, our district has come up with proficiency scales for each of these in grade bands to identify what students are expected to be able to do at the proficient level and what that might look like if they're mastering or approaching that level. Um, we've also decided to report those, and you could do uh, this in your own standards-based report or, or other tools that you use with parents to report how are students doing in these essential skills. They become more important as we uh, identify these and, and indicate where students are at in these skills. And so we've done that within Mastery Connect in our district, but uh, you could do that in several other tools. And uh, lastly, the state has procured a tool that is really interesting. It's the Mastery Transcript. States procured the Mastery Transcript for competency-based education schools who would like to portray these competencies uh, as part of the transcript, the forefront of the transcript is really, as you can see here, those eight essential skills. This is an example of Launch High School's transcript. Uh, which will highlight the student is an excellent critical thinker and creative and design thinker. Um, so these are some interesting paths forward in the in just to get the ideas flowing. What's possible? What can I do? What's out there? Um, to get you started on these ideas. And you'll have many more. The ideation phase does not end right now. It, it extends throughout today and throughout uh, the rest of your summer and probably beyond into your school year. Now, as we think about implementing, how are we going to begin to implement some of this stuff? Can you begin to get a plan together for these digital tools we've talked about and try them out and iterate on those implementations? Or begin to implement design challenges, proficiency scales, uh, reports possibly in transcripts when that um, infrastructure is available to you. So I'd like to take a look at what does a good design challenge look like that actually integrates these essential skills. And we've made a quick collection of a video that does just that. Iron County School District has adopted the human-centered design process created by IDEO, which is used by professional organizations throughout the world. We use this process to help our educators tackle big issues like designing new schools and designing reforms to our district-wide grading systems. We also use this design thinking process to help our students build the essential skills that our community has selected as part of our district's profile of a graduate. But what does this look like in the classroom? As students study Utah history and westward expansion, they learn about the Union Pacific Railway and the role of the railway in our local iron mines. Since today some of these railways in our county are unused, we ask, how might we make the best use of abandoned railways in Iron County? Students follow IDEO's design thinking process of seeking inspiration and understanding, generating ideas and bringing them to life, and implementing these ideas with real people or organizations. Students begin the inspiration phase by seeking understanding from local residents as to how they would like to see the railway best used. They practice communication skills as they interview residents to gain empathy for their point of view. Students begin the ideation phase by collaboratively generating bold ideas and solutions for making the best use of the abandoned railways. Here, they learn how to build off other people's ideas and other competencies required for good collaboration. Students then take these ideas and critically think about their solutions, reflecting on how they meet the needs of the people they are designing for as they refine their critical thinking and problem-solving skills. 
Next, they bring their ideas to life by designing prototypes of their solutions, their capacity to be creative with the tools they have available, and come up with original thoughts grows as they participate. Within the implementation phase, students seek feedback and critique on their initial solution or prototype. And instead of feeling discouraged about the critique, they exercise a growth mindset to create a better design solution and become resilient as they persist towards excellence, repeating the feedback process. Each student does their part to work towards a final product that they are proud of and exercises responsibility to meet the deadlines of the project. Students may also explore how to budget this project and make it sustainable over time as they understand appropriate aspects of financial literacy that would allow this project to move forward. This design thinking process helps empower Iron County students to solve real problems now so they can be prepared with the skills they need to be successful no matter what their future holds. I hope this has been helpful to think through how you can design a way to integrate those essential skills. If COVID has not already made it clear, we need to take advantage of digital learning and tools to meet the needs of our students. But digital alone is not the answer. Even though by digital learning, students could accomplish our traditional focus, move through curriculum at their own pace, pause, plan, and repeat instruction, be ready for standardized assessments, full of routine skills and advanced technology items, and avoid behavioral distractors so the teacher can feel like, hey, I've, I've covered all my content. Well, it sounds like it might work. However, maintaining this traditional focus of curriculum assessment, teacher-centric role, and simply placing it in a digital environment, well, that leads to absurd proposals like this, where we've got computer-centric instruction. And of course, COVID has also taught us that computer-centric instruction, where we take this traditional focus and put it online is not the answer either. It's missing so much of what you and I both know is key to our purpose of offering education and what that's all about. If you think that this for other shallow virtual instruction is the answer. Well, your day of reckoning is soon coming. I love this quote from General Shinseki. It says this, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. If all we are as educators is content delivery mechanisms, then teachers will be replaced by machines. And in order to avoid this tragic automation of education, we need to shift our values and focus. To start thinking more about those essential skills, human skills, instead of things that we can Google. Start offering more project-based assessments that integrate our skills with these essential skills with our content instead of bubble sheets. And focusing on the students and their interests and their needs personally instead of our interests and our fixed curriculum. You see, as we transform our schools and our classrooms to be designed on purpose, know that this is a journey. It's not going to be a quick detour. Going in alone can be scary. But now's the time. And if we want to ride confidently into that future, we'll need all hands on deck. I hope this has been helpful. I'd love to share more resources with you that are available at tinyurl.com forward slash UEN Reimagine Learning. These resources as well as these slides and other links I'll share with you are available. I look forward to connecting with you at, on Twitter and through email at Corey Henwood on Twitter um, and look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you so much for your time today.